So I would like to thank everybody for joining us uh, on this uh, very important panel. Uh, this panel is going to, de to discuss the topic of the crewing crisis. As you have seen from the very beginning of our forum today, the crewing crisis, the human crisis has been on everybody's mind. And indeed it is a topic that has been discussed again and again. Uh, it's one of the most critical topics in shipping today. And I'm honored and delighted to have with us uh, such a tremendous uh, group uh, of panelists. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Joe Hughes for moderating it, uh, moderating it Polis, uh, Guy, Alex, Fred, uh, Stephen, and Alan for joining and giving their insight. I will um, turn over the floor to, uh, to Joe. I just wanted to say that the, the reason we're having this panel today is not only because it's a critical topic in the industry, but we would like to discuss how we ultimately move from discussion to results. There has been plenty of discussion and results have been achieved to some degree, but much more needs to be done. And I think this panel exactly is going to focus on how we move to results. So Joe, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Nicholas. I just want to say how very honored I am to have the opportunity of moderating such an illustrious panel, uh, such a distinguished group of um, industry leaders on this vitally important subject. I'm Joe Hughes, as, as Nicholas said. I, I'm the uh, chairman and chief executive of the managers of the American PI Club, which is an international group club. We provide uh, third party uh, liability uh, cover for ship owners from all over the world. We're based here in New York, um, but we are truly international. I'd just like briefly to introduce our panelists this morning. Um, their full biographies are available uh, as part of the agenda material, so I won't go into the detail of them. Um, th they are very distinguished, as you'll see when you look through those biographies. But from the top, we have um, Stephen Cotton, who is the Secretary General of the International Transport Workers Federation, the ITF. We have Guy Platten, who is Secretary General of the International Chamber of Shipping, the ICS. We have um, Frederick Kenny, Fred Kenny, who is Director of Legal Affairs and External Relations at the International Maritime Organization, the IMO. We have Alex uh, Hadjipateras, who is the Executive Vice President, Business Development at Dorian LPG, uh, based in Athens. Uh, and we have uh, Mr. Polis Hajioanu, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Safe Bulkers Inc, who is uh, on the panel today from uh, Limassol in Cyprus. And we have Mr. Alan Falkenberg, who is the CEO of Crew Management at V Group. Um, as Nicholas said, of all the baleful consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, as it has affected the shipping industry, the severe dislocation of crewing turnover has proved to be among the worst. This has become a genuine humanitarian crisis and which unusually for matters concerning the maritime community, concerning the shipping industry, has in fact attracted the attention of the mainstream media uh, in many parts of the world. It has all also stimulated industry initiatives such as the Neptune Declaration, uh, a more recent one which I saw only a, a couple of days ago, uh, and rather catchily was entitled No Shipping, No Shopping. Um, and all of these have been seeking to intensify the pressure on governments and other stakeholders to solve the problem in a rational and cooperative way. Although progress has been achieved to some extent over recent months, there clearly remains a great deal more to do. In the meantime, seafarers continue to play a vitally important role in keeping the arteries of global trade in full flow. This contribution to our collective well-being deserves not only our gratitude, but also the collaboration, I suggest, of all industry actors, uh, both to alleviate the humanitarian distress the crisis has generated 
as well as to obviate the, the other negative implications that it has. And I say this as, a, as, an, as an insurer, as a marine insurer, uh, for example, in issues concerning safety at sea. So with that general background, um, what I would like to do is ask each of our panelists um, just to give us a, a brief overview, say two or three minutes, as to how they see from their particular perspective the issue uh, of this crisis at this time. And Stephen, perhaps I could begin with you. Well, thanks, Joe. And uh, uh, I think it's a massive opportunity, fabulous uh, panel. First, a few thank yous. I'll, I'll work with uh, all the UN agencies, Fred at the IMO, the ILO has been exceptional. The cooperation with Guy at the ICS, um, again, and his whole team throughout the period. And of course, I think it's put the ITF in a very <laughs> strange position. And sometimes we've been the advocate for the ship owner. And I think it's a recognition of the maturity of, of our industry that we can have a conversation. We understand that the ship owners didn't start COVID. The reality is they're stuck in the middle like everybody else. So throughout the last, what's nearly 12 months now, we've been working collaboratively Guy will cover the protocols. I think um, there's a couple of big points I want to kind of crash into. Um, the, the crisis isn't over. We've done, we've responded exceptionally well. Collaboratively, ship owners, the good ship owners have done the best they possibly can to move their crew around. But the situation's now got two problems. One is we're at sort of the second or third crew change, and that's coming up. The, the second and third phases of the mutations are bringing challenges to us. And I think for us, and we'll work together with Guy and our colleagues at the, at the IMO, the question of vaccinations. The, the distribution of vaccinations is gonna be a dilemma for the world as we know it. Um, I came off a global union meeting this morning about how do we deal with the inequality of distribution. So it's strange that I would advocate, and I am advocating, that the seafarers need to be treated differently. And part of our challenge now is how do we co-opt governments, those co-governments are the willing, to help us. And let's bear in mind our seafarers come from the global south and the politics of distribution of vaccines will be extremely difficult. And I think there's a job for us, together with our partners around this table, to put in place practical steps um, that we can help and build transitional spots, ports where we can administer vaccinations and so that we can move those seafarers. It's great news that the Johnson & Johnson one-shot vaccination has been approved and uh, we see that as part of the solution. I will touch on and I hope we get some questions on it. When I talked about us being an advocate for the ship owners, if I could tell you how many articles I've had to deal with in respect of charterers and uh, there are no crew change clauses, um, it's filled the last few months. And it's, I've learned more about chartering than I probably thought a trade union official should know. But the issue isn't resolved. So the collaboration around the Neptune statement is great work. Many, many good companies and from all sectors have applied. But as we move forward, we still need to see some shift from the chartering industry. Um, it's not normal, it's not business as normal. And it's critical that we're in a position to respond to the ship owners and make sure where we can change crew, we can change crew. And the final point, Joe, if I could just squeeze one more inch. Of course. We need to build seafarers' confidence. Mm. Um, they lack confidence about going back to sea. And we need to educate them that vaccines are safe and critical to future trade. Um, and we need to give them the confidence that when they go back to the ships, they can get back in a good contract time. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Guy, what about you? What's the perspective from the International Chamber of Shipping? Thank you very much, Joe. Yeah, and just to echo the thanks of Steve, really. I mean, it's been unprecedented amounts of collaboration over the last year across industry, across the UN bodies, and we have made some progress. It's not enough. There's still much more to do, but we have. And I'd also want to pay tribute to the seafarers, of course. Um, they've gone through extraordinary lengths to sort of keep everything going. And some of them have made lots of personal sacrifices. A very good friend of mine is a chief engineer, did an additional 150 days on a 60 day contract last year in order to, uh, before he got home. So I do pay tribute to them and also to the ship owners and the ship managers who are on this call as well, because I know the extraordinary efforts they've gone to in order to, 
just do anything they can do to actually affect the crew changes. And I know that's been quite emotionally stressful for their staff as well to, to make that happen as well, the shore staff. We've put in place all sorts of things over the year, framework of protocols. So we, we, we are very focused on the safety and well-being of our seafarers to get them to and from. But it's, and some governments have reacted to it. They've classified them as key workers. And as Fred will probably talk about as well, we, we need far more governments to recognize them as key workers. Um, we've heard about the Neptune Declaration and all these things. So there's been a good, strong drumbeat of media attention. We're all aware of the problem. I think Nicholas challenges to come up with solutions as, as, as well in this. We can't just go on about the problems. And I want to talk about vaccinations as well. I mean, the extraordinary speed of the development of vaccines is something which we can all be proud of as a, as a, as a, as a global community. And it's going to allow economies to get back to normal quicker than we ever thought possible. But, and this is the logic, it's, 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 that's only going to be possible if we have a seamless resilient supply chain. And with, as Steve saying, that a, a vast proportion of our workforce comes from developing nations whose access to vaccine is going to be limited. I think we have a very, very strong case to be able to procure vaccines on behalf of our seafarers and for industry to make sure that resilience of the supply chain continues. And, the one thing I will just finish on, which I am afraid of now as well, is the issue is the introduction of vaccine passports. They are on their way. The European Union is openly talking about them. Other countries are. We mustn't get into a situation that then stops us doing crew changes again because the crews themselves haven't had the vaccine at that point. So it's a real lobbying of governments, lobbying of industry, and we can deliver for our seafarers if we're allowed to do so. So uh, I, I leave it at that. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much, Guy. That's, uh, well, I mean, that segues rather well, actually, into, uh, in, into Fred's statement, I guess, actually. At the IMO, you must be hearing all this in quadraphonic sound, it seems to me. Uh, so uh, what, what's, what's your perspective? Well, uh, I think that's an accurate description, Joe. And, and first, I want to thank Capital Link for, for holding this panel. Um, I participated in one uh, about a year ago as this uh, crisis was just unfolding. And here we are. Uh, and uh, while we've made some progress, uh, we still have a long way to go. Um, a lot has been done, as Guy and Steve have just mentioned, and the level of cooperation and collaboration really has been un unprecedented. But when you look at things like um, the IMO Maritime Safety Committee's uh, endorsement of uh, the industry developed protocols for crew changes, uh, the Maritime Safety Committee's resolution regarding uh, encouraging um, countries to designate seafarers as key workers and, and to facilitate crew changes, which ultimately led to the UN General Assembly adopting their resolution on December 1st, also calling uh, for um, uh, designation of seafarers as key workers. Now, that was the 192 uh, member states of the IMO and that resolution was adopted without objection. It was unanimous. But as of today, we still only have 56 countries that have designated seafarers as key workers. We, we must have more. Uh, it is one of the cornerstones that can assist in facilitating crew changes, but also, as Guy and Steve were just talking about, uh, with the advent of vaccines, uh, it's important that seafarers uh, are designated as key workers so they can be moved up the priority list to get vaccinated through their domestic programs. Uh, in addition, uh, we are actively looking at how we can uh, provide vaccines to seafarers uh, that may not have access to them in their home countries because their domestic programs hadn't started yet. And, and we're looking at options there. That may be a, a very difficult challenge, but I think it's one that we have to undertake uh, if we're going to get the workforce vaccinated so that they can continue to flow freely. We're already starting to see reports of, uh, of some ports that are gonna be requiring people to be vaccinated in their ports. Uh, this is an ominous development if we don't have a plan in place uh, to get seafarers vaccinated. So we, we, we really need to look at that closely. Now, um, as you mentioned, Joe, 
the visibility on this issue, I, I dare to say in, in my time at the, uh, at the IMO, and I think previously, this issue has probably gotten more global attention in the media uh, than any issue maybe in the history of maritime. Uh, we're getting unprecedented coverage across the major media outlets. Just as an example, uh, the day that the Neptune Declaration was issued, that was picked up by over 900 media outlets around the world with a reach of more than 1 billion people. Uh, shipping doesn't do that every day. Uh, but what, what I think the, the nut that we haven't cracked yet is how do we translate that outreach and that visibility into action by governments to the whole point of this outreach effort should be to reach the decision makers who need to say, gee, we really need to do something for seafarers and, and turn that into action. As Guy and Steve mentioned, we are seeing some progress from a high of about 400,000 seafarers being stranded on ships in, uh, in December with another 400,000 waiting to get on board. Um, uh, it, the numbers are better. We don't know exactly what they are, but they're better. Uh, but it, it, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, more countries need to designate their seafarers as key workers, and everyone needs to advocate for it, no matter what segment of the industry you're from. This is an all-hands-on-deck evolution. And just to wrap up, uh, I'll just remind everyone of the, the World Maritime theme for this year is seafarers at the core of shipping's future. But I would also say that seafarers need to be at the core of shipping's present, and we need to recognize that and do something for them. And I will get off my soapbox now and stop there. <laughs> well, thank you, Fred. Yes, I'm clearly uh, the, the, the vital importance of the seafarer globally is, is more recognized now, uh, probably than it has been for years and years and years. But from an individual a uh, ship owner and operator's point of view, Alex. I mean, how have you been seeing it um, uh, in over the last several months? And what have you been doing to try and alleviate the circumstances in which seafarers find themselves? Thank you, Joe, and uh, thank you, everyone. I, I echo what uh, Stephen was saying in the beginning. I believe that towards the end of last year, for our sector, at least for LPG, we tended, we were seeing a, a light at the end of the tunnel. We'd reduced from about 50% over contract uh, of our seafarers to under 10%. And the challenge, and we, we'd um, had more ports opening up, more places that we could uh, change. And then we had these second strains come about and some more restrictions put in place uh, in uh, Asia. And this kind of, you know, we, we didn't relax, but uh, we realized that this is not consistent. So we really need a, a plan for the future. What we had done as a company is we put in very intensive testing control procedures because it was not only about being able to do the change, but to do it safely. So uh, having a pre-testing, testing upon arrival as well. And the availability of testing was, was very positive. Uh, I also believe that as we move to the vaccination point, education around the vac vaccination is very important too. There is a fear factor with certain nationalities about the vaccine, especially now that you have different vaccines coming out People want to kind of wait and see other people having done the vaccine to see if it's okay. And I see that this is going to be one of our challenges. But um, no, I think that whereas LPG has, police will say, but been a little bit better off than dry where they've had ships stranded, we don't think that there's kind of a green light now. We were still very cautious and, and we really need a plan for the future that we can rely on and not just say one port's open this week and then it closes the next week. Thank you very much, Alex. Polis, uh, uh, you, you operate mainly dry bulk carriers. Does, how has it affected you? We yes, I'm on now. Yes. Hello to everyone. Yes, look, I mean, uh, I think the, this panel, in order to, to be also productive uh, for the general uh, uh, good of, of all uh, the industry, the seafarers, uh, the owners, all the organizations. I think we should try and be a little bit practical as well on what we can uh, do and where the pressure should be mounted in order to find viable solutions 
because as Stephen said, this, this thing is not going to pass like this. We'll have it in front of us for the next couple of years at least, even if things will be better than uh, what we have until now. So my experience last year was really, really bad and terrible because on one hand, we had to face the awful dry bulk market caused by the slowdown of world economies, you know, freight markets in the first half of 2020 was down to $4,000 a day. And at the same time, I had to give up everything else that I was doing just to get in charge of uh, chartering and operations departments to argue with every Dick and Harry, sorry for the expression, uh, about charter parties and crew change clauses and uh, deviation clauses, etc. Because when the market is against the owner and you are bleeding, they, they kneel on your neck, I uh, use this expression, and they impose things that are inhuman. They impose clauses in that you are not allowed to make a crew change and you have the people on board eight months. You are not allowed to make any deviation, even if it is for owner's account and owner's expense. You are not allowed to call anywhere outside the route that the charter will instruct. And imagine a ship owner, you have 50 ships and you have to negotiate every time with 50 different people and trying to explain to them that this, this is beyond is beyond our uh, ability and we have to do it for humanitarian reasons because as you know very well our industry in general work mostly with far eastern uh, uh, seamen especially from uh, philippines for many many years which they are excellent seamen and very professional people and in seamen in in uh, philippines in other countries you know they are it's not easy to make crew changes before the holidays christmas holidays all these things because the, the new seamen, they, they want to spend uh, Christmas with their families. We come into January and February when all the crew changes should happen. And we had ha a COVID running like mad in Asia and in, in Europe. And you have to spend virtually 80% of your day trying to convince people to see the humanitarian aspect of this uh, problem. It was really, I mean, there were six months I remember in uh, in shipping, not because we were bleeding money like uh, uh, the market, because we knew that this would uh, change after a year or whatever, and we could uh, cope with it. But because we had every, every day to fight for simple things. We had to fly people from the Philippines to join a vessel passing through the middle of the Indian Ocean in, in some island, I don't know where, in the middle of the ocean. The people had to fly from Manila to go to Dubai, change a plane, wait there 10 hours, go to Paris, get another, a third plane from Paris to fly in the middle of the Indian Ocean and get in the island on time to, to catch the ship that was passing uh, nearby the, that island. This was a ridiculous exercise, let alone the cost that it was 10 times more than the ordinary crew change. But it was ridiculous because flights were canceled, people who were got stuck either in Dubai or in Paris, and by the time they would arrive in Re Reunion or in other places, Mauritius, I don't know which places we were doing the crew changes, uh, the urgent ones, uh, the ship has, was already there waiting for a day or two days. Okay, at $4,000 a day is not a huge uh, loss, but <laughs> you had to put the ship waiting as well to, for the crew to go on board. And people, it seems like they were from another planet and they considered that the crew problem is an owner's problem, whilst it's an industry problem, because the crew is a servant, not only for the ship owner, the ship owner is a taxi driver, we provide the hardware. The cargo is not mine, the cargo is belonging to huge companies, to huge conglomerates who have huge profits every quarter, $100 million, $500 million, $1 billion, and these people, they don't give the right instructions down the line of, of the authority to, to their organization uh, of how to treat with the things that uh, afford uh, human life and safety of life at sea. So for me, this is the main issue to try and find practical solutions to help the industry. And I have a proposal to make to concentrate the whole industry on two things, the vaccinations rightly, as you said, which must be given priority for the crew members. So the crew changes to happen easier and to have safety on board ships and for the environment and for all these people and concentrate on key ports around the world, 
places like Singapore, make safe corridors there. It's not so difficult to do that. All the ships pass from Singapore two or three times a year, as far as I know, on all sectors, whether they are containers, dry bulk, tankers, uh, LNGs, they all pass one or two or three times a year from Singapore. Make a safe corridor in that nice port there, that is a maritime nation as well. The seaman can be tested on board before he disembarks with a rapid test and all this. Create a safe corridor with a launch to go straight next to the air airport to a safe uh, place to wait there and then embark to the flight and, and, the, and the guy to go home in, with a three hours flight instead of making the round the world trip on stay, or staying on board ships for more than uh, 12 months. I think this is a solution. All of us, will we, we have to sit down and find places like Singapore and try to explain to the maritime authorities there to create the safe corridor and uh, things like that. Myself, I had a very good cooperation. I told you before when we had uh, some pre-discussion about my experience in a small place like Cyprus. The shipping minister here sat down we explained to him the problem. I'm happy even to deviate my ships when they are passing Suez Canal to come to Limassol and may my, make my crew changes here. With the bus safely, they will go to the airport, isolate and then get, take the flight home. And they listened to this and they opened for us a safe corridor. And after that, we see now, we're very proud to see now big cruise lines like Carnival and other lines. We have 10 cruise ships anchored outside Limassol and making their crew changes now that they are waiting their industry to reopen up again. So my proposal is uh, to work all together to find a safe corridor in Singapore to make our crew changes and then half of our problems will be solved there. This is my proposal in order to be productive in order to help the dialogue and please carry on. I mean, try to explode this corridor for everyone. Thank you, Paulus. That's uh, that's a very that's a very positive view. My goodness, and uh, due credit to the government of Cyprus, with whom we have a relationship as marine underwriters, being regulated actually by the government of Cyprus, we always found them to be extremely helpful. Um, Alan, I, I said earlier that Fred hears things in quadraphonic sound, but as CEO for crew management for V Group, you must see it through a kaleidoscope. I imagine. What, what's your experience? Yeah, uh, of course, I can echo much that's been said already on, on, on this uh, forum here. And I would say, going a little bit back to, I do want to echo the, the collaboration that we've seen in this pandemic uh, across the different um, industry bodies. And, and I think actually that's been one of the positives that you, we have seen in, in this pandemic has been how good we have been at coming together and discussing this. and. I would say everything from, you could say, the industry bodies, the ship owners, the managers, uh, where we probably still have some room to go is, with, as, as mentioned also on the call, with ch charters uh, to some extent. Uh, and then the other thing has been that even though we've seen a lot of support from, from, from governments around the world and also IMO stepping in and trying to coordinate and so on, then it's still, uh, it, it's still come to... Uh, things that has as the key worker status is very positive but what has that really meant uh, for us who is day-to-day -day sitting and logistically trying to solve this conundrum that that it is to do a crew change that's still extremely difficult and and to be honest it's not been it's not been improved to that level that we could expect it 10 months down the line or whatever what now almost 12 months down the line now uh, then it's still quite a, a challenge. Um, and there I would say, uh, I think we, we definitely, I, I think it's positive again to hear what, uh, what has been, been mentioned here around that we are looking at the vaccination books and we're looking at different ways for us to get such passports that, we, that our seafarers can travel with, uh, because that is the way forward. Uh, and maybe picking up a little bit on what uh, was mentioned earlier also around the safe corridors. I have been sitting in in-depth discussions in different forums, both with industry bodies, but also with my competition and with, uh, you could say, forums around how can we just get 
uh, let's say 50 crew members from the Philippines to to uh, to Rotterdam, which should be if we put all our heads together and we talk with all the different bar, uh, authorities on the way, we should be able to do so. And I can tell you that after six weeks of collaboration between 10 of the biggest companies in, in the industry to do that, I think the first uh, charter flight, we were able to get 26 people successfully over. And if you can imagine the, 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 how the situation had worsened since in those six weeks, and that's one of the biggest ports in, 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 uh, to do crew changes in. And, and, and what we've just experienced in these safe corridors is that in that chain, if there's just one link in that chain that doesn't work with the rest, you can forget about it. And there, that, there is a lot of moving parts in such a chain to do a crew change from his, from his home, you could say, to the, to the ship. And, 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 and that's made it really difficult. So I think one of the things we, we, we should look at, how can we, of course, improve that? How can we become uh, more effective in, in, uh, in doing the crew changes? Um, and then I think that that's one of the learnings I would say from from this whole uh, pandemic has been that that uh, we can come together. There is a lot of um, good spirit towards that our seafarers are uh, key to to this whole industry. Um, but I think still we we are missing that we are missing that last mile to really be effective around it. I think that's maybe what we should discuss today: how we we can move that last mile. So, um, yeah. Th thank, you. thank you very much indeed, Alan. Indeed, uh, thank everybody else for those those comments, which, I mean, have set the stage very well indeed. I had a question. Um, well, there are a couple of questions, actually, in regard to the attitude of charterers. Um, and one uh, was addressed to Polis, uh, but for everybody, you know, the, the, how, how sh should the industry deal with those recalcitrant tra charterers who may in circumstances be considered, you know, to, to be acting in an inhumane manner. Is there anything that can be done about that? I mean, Polis, would you want to address that? And perhaps Guy could look at it from the ICS point of view and indeed Stephen, who would like to go first? Yes, okay. I take the first answer. I think I think the situation since uh, the end of last year has developed uh, has uh, developed positively because uh, also this uh, Neptune declaration, some other declarations, charters have joined into those and and uh, tried. Uh, they, they have started to understand also their responsibilities towards this element. So we have more cooperation now. The, the terrible situation I was describing before was especially in the first half of 2020 because uh, charters, we were not in a position to understand how difficult the problem was and uh, they were simply refusing anything because they had the top hand on the, on the, commercial, uh, on the commercial equation. So obviously they want to get their cargo from A to B as fast as possible and with the less risk and the less deviation and all these things and the owner had the, to face the problem uh, by himself uh, along the way so I, I believe the last few months the last two or three months we see more cooperation because uh, it's a, it's an issue that is involving uh, more people uh, they, they have uh, they have uh, ships uh, taking back ships again on period so they have they are commercially running the ships and they have to find the solutions also for their benefit. So they cooperate more. And I think slowly, slowly is uh, this, uh, this uh, people as well uh, start to be behave more responsibly. The big charters, to be fair to them, the Cargills and the Bungis and those, uh, the big ones of this world, they are behaving correctly from the beginning. And I have to admit that because I have uh, enough ships with them and I know that they've been doing always their best to cooperate. What I believe we should focus, I repeat again, three, two or three or five maritime nations could solve the problem. If we stick, it's not only Singapore I mentioned before, if we stick to these two, three key points around the world that ships are passing all the time, uh, both in laden and in ballast conditions, and we stick to those three ports and explain to the, to the governments of these places that the seamen are the safest uh, members of the public that they are traveling because they're on board the ship eight months or seven months 
They don't go most of the time anywhere. They are tested every now and then. The other seamen who are replacing them, they are tested two, two times before they get on the plane to join the ship. So they are, the sick. They are not going to spread COVID around these people. If, if they were the only travelers around the world, the, world, the, the COVID problem would have been solved, uh, you know, simply by seamen. So they are not dangerous species and they should uh, behave uh, in a way that they are afraid. If we find two or three places like Singapore, like Gibraltar, like uh, South Africa, now is, South Africa is very accommodating now, you know, for crew changes, uh, pass, passing OPL Cape Town. Uh, these places could solve the issue and then we don't have to bother with 100 countries with bureaucracy and all these things. Yes. Uh, we all pass from these places two or three times a year and I think let's concentrate ICS, IMO, ITF, ILO, whoever else is starting with an I. <laughs> we all cooperate. <laughs> we all cooperate on this aspect and focus the attention to this. Uh, the Singapore uh, Maritime Authority is very accommodating, they are very accommodating people. For God's sake, they can make a safe corridor from the anchorage to the airport without risking the, the Singaporean uh, population by seamen who are COVID free, who are COVID free anyway. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Alex, what, what's your view on that? I mean, as an operator, I mean, do you, I mean, do you see it? Do you, I mean, I, I would imagine in your trade, you perhaps don't deal with as broader range of, of, of charters perhaps as in the dry bulk trades. Is that right? We're dealing with uh, uh, oil majors and then uh, some major charters who may also work in dry bulk, but they have uh, LPG. Um, I, I think that the places that Paulis mentioned like South Africa and Singapore, we're also using and uh, Panama, that these are, it's a very good point about the safe corridors. And I think Singapore uh, specifically was the first country to give priority access to the maritime professionals. And they said that they would vaccinate up to 10,000 by the end of uh, January. So they took a step ahead. Uh, I think, you know, we have to work on the logistics a little bit sometimes with the timing because you need to have the, the two weeks staying at home, the tests, arrival, meeting up with the ships. But I, I do agree that, you know, ultimately what we're saying between all of us is that in order to solve this, you have to go to some government body. So to Paulus's point about the fewer government bodies you have to go to and the more forward thinking, you know, the more likely that we are to achieve results. And this is all before Guy's point about the vaccination passport, which will imminently come out in the next, you know, six months. And then it's another story. So I think if we could alleviate the pressure valve now, it would set us up uh, for the future to deal with this uh, vaccination issue where many countries like the Philippines, I know we were speaking with our agency there that certain governments have bought more and some have less. So you maybe have to put a private syndicate together to buy vaccines. So this is also a parallel challenge that we're facing. Steve, I know you were nodding uh, vigorously there with some of the comments made. I mean, what, what, what can the ITF do in this particular regard? I suppose we can name and shame, Joe. I think, unfortunately, that's the key the key issue. I mean, if I could have found Polis six months ago, I could have got Bloomberg off my back because they were asking us to name names. Um, and the reality is the ship owners don't want to upset their clients. And I'm, I kind of get that. But um, again, I kind of want to echo what, what everyone's saying, but Polis in particular, there are some good charges. Let's not call everybody and just make, make it completely wrong. But there are also some charters who are still living in the 1970s and without operating in those, you know, the recognition, this is an extraordinary situation. And this is a humanitarian issue. And, you know, the, the reality that <laughs> I've seen discreetly from many ship owners who I dare say I would call friends, have sent me the, the what, what do you have to fill out to get the ship fixed? Um, and the reality, obviously, the risk with the oil majors and the understanding, they're much more sophisticated and they've come up with new ways of avoiding the responsibility and that we can deal with. But some of those charters that Polis has to deal with and in a market at that rate, he can't afford to have his ships without cover. So for us, and we said, you know, our friends in the Global Maritime Forum and Guy told me to calm down and I accept that. But the reality is if we don't name names, it's 2021, this isn't going away. Charters can't be the hitting element 
of the of the maritime industry. Every single one of the ship owners on here has a, a ream of responsibilities, auditing, complying with, accountability. So the charters have to come to the party and they have to take some responsibility. So for us, it's a very harsh issue. And, you know, in the end, we probably have to go up the top of the chain polis to these multinationals and talk about their due diligence programs, their reputational risk, and put the spotlight on it. I hate to use uh, legal technology <laughs> terminology, but that's the reality. There's a reputational risk here. If we can prove it, we will. So those are those issues. And just to echo, the, the again, and, and particularly to mention Singapore and Cyprus, and I saw Guy nodding. We've been doing a lot of work with Singapore. We recognise they want to lead. We've met with them and, and, and um, Joe and the Secretary General of the IMO. They want to lead by example and... I'll leave you the protocols. But the reality is someone's got to lead. We have to break the COVAX position about only governments can secure vaccines. So we need, in our coalition with the industry, we need some of these governments that can be hubs. And just to mention Cyprus, I've got nothing but positive language to talk about them in this sense. They've spoken to all of us in, the, in this coalition that work on it every day, and they've been striving to find solutions. So I hope when we come up with uh, governments that will support us on the reallocation of vaccines, that Cyprus could be one of those, both, both as, a, as a shipping hub for crew change and I hope vaccinations as we go forward, but also we need to get some of our, my colleagues in aviation, who we also represent, to get them in the air as well. So uh, I, I, there's some really positive, uh, constructive proposals coming out of today's session. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Steve. Guy, I mean, clearly, what, what's the ICS view on that? Largely collaborative, I would have thought, actually. It's been hugely collaborative. I mean, we work yeah. very closely with Steve because we recognise this is a shared problem and needs a shared solution in order to get it. And I think, um, you know, we, we've managed to get hold of some of the, the bigger charters now, and there's a the meeting being held actually this Thursday, sort of to try and get them to, to make up to their responsibilities to the wider charter network. It's funny, it's about the only part of industry that hasn't got an industry body to represent it. So you've got chip managers and chip owners and others, and, 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 they, and but they, they, they're sort of, they're lacking. And I think they're suddenly realising they're on the wrong side of history now, and they've got to get their act together. So it'll be good to say, really good to hear from policy saying that the, the things have changed over the last few months, but there's still a long, long way to, to go on that. And uh, and you're right, there's some like-minded guy. I had a, a meeting with the Deputy Shipping Minister on Friday. And he's very passionate about the vaccinations and very supportive of what we're trying to do about that. And also Norway are increasingly getting involved and, and, and very um, positive about it. Singapore as well. So we're slowly building that coalition of willing governments, I think, who we can leverage over the next coming weeks and months in order to roll out a vaccination programme for our seafarers that, that Steve's talked about as well. Thank you, Guy. Well, all, many of these roads, actually, uh, Fred, seem to lead to not necessarily the I, uh, IMO as an institution in itself, but certainly the responses of governments. And there seems to be a very uh, considerable distinction between governments in various parts of the world as to their amenability to create solutions for this, this problem. I mean, what's your perspective on that? Well, I think, uh, you know, both the IMO and the ILO have been serving as, as a good platform for governments to uh, come together and, and uh, attempt to do the right things. And I think that'll continue into this year. I, I um, you know, we, uh, the, the Maritime Safety Committee coming up in May uh, has the impacts of COVID-19 as an agenda item. And I'm fully expecting that we will have a robust discussion on where we are with the seafarer crew change crisis at that time. I mean, certainly we don't wanna wait uh, and there is other action going on within the, the wider UN community going back to the issue of, of uh, the no crew change clauses. And I think there was a question in the chat is, is why aren't we naming people like here and now? And I, I think the danger there is, is a lot of what we get is anecdotal uh, where this may be a much bigger problem. Um, but, uh, and, and as Steve mentioned, one of the things that concerns me is that, you know, our secretary general came out very strongly condemning no crew change clauses in, in uh, December. Uh, but what we've seen that 
replaced by is a tactic, as, as Steve has mentioned, where the ship just isn't fixed. And that's particularly the case in the short term time, time charter industry. Uh, you know, if, if somebody wants to fix a ship for two weeks, they're saying, well, I don't want to deal with any crew change. Well, that two weeks is part of some seafarer's life if that ship gets fixed and, and their contract is expired. So um, this really is, uh, everybody needs to be aware of this. Um, the UN Global Compact in, com uh, in coordination with IMO, ILO and the, and the UN uh, Commission on Human Rights will be providing a, a human rights due diligence tool uh, for the industry that specifically addresses these issues that that companies, particularly charterers, need to be looking at before they're they're making contract demands to see whether they're you know as a matter of corporate social responsibility, uh, they're living up to their humanitarian responsibilities because for seafarers that have now been on board for we're hearing reports of 21, 22 months, we got a report in yesterday from a seafarer who. Uh, was stranded on board at the beginning of the crisis, was able to get repatriated, uh, took another contract and is now stranded again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, you know, this just, this, it can't continue. And, and we all have to work together to resolve it. Thank you. We have, I think, four minutes left, gentlemen. Um, just as a final word, beginning with you, Steve, for 30 seconds or thereabouts, where does this end and how do you think? So I think the one area that we, we, we just need to strengthen is uh, the cooperation with governments. And that, that I think we, we, the strategic decision about which countries want to make a difference. And at some level, we have to highlight those that don't. A lot, a lot of economies depend on the shipping industry. And we need to capitalize on the media that we picked up and we need to highlight those like Cyprus, like Singapore, those countries that are going the extra mile to keep the world moving and draw that to the highest possible level of political governance. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Guy, your view. Just to build on that, it, it is, it's, to me, it's vaccinations are the route out of this for our, for our crews going forward. And therefore, we need to really prioritise that, raise the issue, get that coalition of willing governments to coalesce around a solution. We know we can do that. And so uh, to me, that's, that's, that's what we need to focus on the next weeks and months so that we can keep global trade moving again. Thank you. Fred. I don't really don't have a lot more to add from what uh, what Guy and Steve just said. We we all have to continue working collaboratively and cooperatively to build on this. Um, uh, and certainly, vaccines are one answer. But I, I think in the long term, we we're going to need to take action to make sure that this never happens again. And that is going to require a lot of uh, intensive, deep thought by both the industry and the governments because this is preventable uh, and uh, we need to make sure that we do that in the future. A, a final word from you, Alex. I would just add, I think that uh, the people like the Global Maritime Forum have done a great job getting this in the media and it's not just a story. Of course, you have the stranded seafarers, but going forward, we have to keep this awareness alive, use social media, and, uh, you know, it's sometimes out of sight, out of mind. I've written in the response, and we have to make sure that people don't forget and look towards the future, too. Thank you. Polis, a final word. Yes, I think the vaccination priority to be given to the, to the seamen by the maritime nations like Philippines, the other uh, nations that they... they, they they have uh, seamen like uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, I don't know, Vietnam, the other, all these nations to give priority to their seamen to be vaccinated first so they can bring also the, the, uh, their sailors back home nice and safe and themselves back nice and safe home and safe corridors in key ports around the world, mainly the ports that they are in the crossroads, Gibraltar, Singapore, South Africa, that sort of places. It will solve the problem. To get it uh, again, stress that the charters after July, August, after the first six months, they realize the problem and they start cooperating. 
We right. don't have big problems right now. The big problems and the terrible situation in human, in human situation was the first half of 2020. We had a, a crashing market and no, no one wanted to touch this problem. I personally took it on my hands. I threatened counterparties that I will stop cooperating and doing business with them if they don't cooperate in this matter. Because all the crew changes fell right after the Christmas holiday when COVID hit us very hard. And now I think with those people, because I have the list here of the Neptune holders, and uh, I see many charters being on the list, I'm very happy to say. And uh, I think most of them uh, that they are on the list, they are, doing a, they are doing a good job right now as we talk. Thank so you. So it's a good, a good development. Thank you. And you have the very final word, Alan, briefly. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So I would say uh, three things. Free movement in short term, free movement of our seafarers. And this is really around visa on arrival. If they're key workers, let's make sure we don't need to, to, to do some of these very bureaucratic uh, measurements that we normally do so we can have our seafarers free movement. Then meanwhile, we sort out the vaccination uh, challenge and, and definitely get our seafarer bumped up on, on in priority on vaccinations. And last but not least, don't forget that our seafarers, it might not be our neighbors, any, all, all of us lives in countries where there's not so many seafarers left. It might not be our neighbors anymore, but they are very much human beings who also misses their family and needs to get home and we should treat them as such. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, gentlemen, our session, our time is up. Thank you most warmly for a splendid panel. And uh, over to you, Nicholas. Well, I really don't have anything to say except uh, to stress what you mentioned, splendid panel. Splendid panel, passionate, practical, to the point. Uh, really can't thank you enough uh, for uh, sharing your, your passion and wisdom and, and commitment. We have to thank you as well for giving us the panel and the forum to be able to pass on these comments, all these distinguished people sitting here today uh, for the common good and the common benefit of all our seafarers, of all our companies and the whole world, uh, the, the world as a whole. And thank Capital Link for giving this opportunity. That, that's why I was asking you, you are pressing me to go on the dry bulk panel. I say which strike by bulk panel. I will go on the seafarers panel because this is the main issue and this is the thing that we have to solve. And thank you very much for giving us all this opportunity. Well, I'm and the one thanking you. And to Joseph for handling it uh, so effectively. <laughs> thank you. You're very kind. Yeah. No, but I had a wonderful panel to deal with. Thank you. Thank you so much thank to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.